Okay, so, um, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Danny, social experimentalist. Hey, you wanna uh, say? Yeah, and I'm Eurosol from Eureka.org, and we are both on Steemit. So, I guess we're probably gonna be mostly talking to people on Steemit and YouTube, so hello everyone out there in internet land. Yeah. So, um, there's quite a few things that are on my mind at the moment, and I just wanted to say that I've always wanted to do this with you ever since I met you. Um, actually, I've never even met you, have I, really? But ever since I first knew you, which was about four weeks ago. Um, so, it's lovely to be here. There's a few things, a few topics that I want to speak about. I want to speak about Steemit, um, money. I um, also want to speak about uh, witnessing what that means on Steemit, because uh, you're a witness, um, and um, I'm not 100% sure what that really means. I kind of got a vague idea. And I also want to speak about contradiction and hypocrisy and um, my my experience with living in so much contradiction. Um, so those are things I want to speak about. What do you want to speak about? Okay, yeah. I mean, I'm, those are common topics. I'm quite happy to talk about that. Um, this isn't... Uh, we have actually met physically, just so you know, but that was a speaker's... Oh, yeah. Um, and I was just surrounded by various random people. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but those topics sound good to me. Um, I'm in, in case people don't really know who I am, I am a witness on, on Steam, Steamit, and that means basically I run a server which is part of the infrastructure that actually keeps Steemit running behind the scenes. Um, it's a fairly uh, detailed process that goes on, but I can, I'm can i happy to sort of answer any questions you have on that. Other than that, I run my own social network, uh, which is called Eureka, U-R-E-K-A dot org. And I also do quite a lot of other things as well, behind the scenes, making music and working for clients, making software and all kinds of different things. So, um, Generally, I focus on healing and psychology and um, many, many different subjects, actually, outside of software as well. So, I kind of, um, every question people ask me tends to get a long answer. Let's put it like that. So, um, so we could be here for a while just answering this one. I'll draw yeah. the line at that one. Yeah, that, that, yeah, but <laughs> um, yeah, so, but, you know, I'm quite happy to talk about pretty much anything. So, anything that you want to talk about, let's go. I'm fine. Okay. Um, well, I kind of suppose I'll, I'll start with uh, the per personal the personal thing is, it, you know, living, I, I wanted to talk about this for a while on my YouTube channel. Um, it, it's that the, whole, the whole idea of the contradictions in which I live and kind of, it's funny because I'm, I'm wearing a t-shirt which says slave free on it. And it's from this company called Visible, I think they're called. And uh, you can see who made the whole thing. They're already, you know, they've done loads of research. They try and treat everybody along the way well. And, uh, you know, so this is free of slavery. The problem with that is that this is not free of slavery. This is actually made of wool. And there's a contradiction in and of itself. Um, and I, I know that, that you're vegan, if I'm not mistaken. And... Um, and I've been vegan for a year and a quarter. And, and I'm, I was thinking about the fact that I'm wearing the wool. And it's like, I only realized how unconscious, uh, I've been, I've been most of my life when it came to eating, in particular eating the flesh of sentient beings. I only realized that once I stopped doing it. And now I look back at it and, and I think, I just like, I just can't, I can't believe that I did that for 40, well, for 49 years because I was still eating fish until last year. Right. So for 14 years of my life, I did that. And, you know, and out of those 49, 30 of them, I was an adult. You know, oh yeah, when I was a child, fair enough. I just, you know, how would I possibly know that there's a problem with it? But as an adult, 30 years, and I look back at it and I think, my God. Right, I'm shocking, shocked that I, you know, that I look at, when I see dead flesh of animal, I don't see food anymore. I just see it as like, it's just really sad. I go, I go in, you know, I go into Sainsbury's and it's really sad. They've just got a whole fridge full of dismembered animal parts. For what? You know? 
And 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 then having said that, I hope one day I'll I'll realise that like what the hell do I want to be wearing that the wool from an animal has been ripped from it. God knows how the animal's treated. God knows how the wool was ripped from it. It was ripped from it without its permission. What do I want to wear that on me? And I'll probably stop wearing it soon, maybe even after today. You know, but 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 and then you know that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know. Um, I'm in a car right now, you know, which is run on petrol. God only knows how they got hold of that petrol and the, all the crimes involved along the way, the dollar and the petro dollar and God, I don't, I don't even know about all that type of stuff, right? You know, and and then there's the very technology that we're using right now, the iPhone made by God knows who in awful conditions, you know, maybe they're better conditions than. Some of the other people in China are great, okay? You know, and I'm using that. And um, I, I, I can only imagine that the only way to not to live in in, in contradiction is, would be to go and live in a field somewhere, completely away from all of this. Yeah, or, or a um, basically, yeah. I mean, I think the jungle yeah. is probably... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think, you know, what, what came up for me when you were saying, when you were relaying that was, uh, the idea of normalization and the way that what you're describing is overpowering, isn't it? We're over, people are being overpowered, animals are being overpowered. And when we're children, we're overpowered by our parents and, and by ideas of conformity. And we're basically, we decide, oh, it's more important to conform than it is to be who we are. Because when we are who we are, we get told off a lot of the time. Uh, but if we conform, then, Things are okay, so that's like an unconscious program that says it's you know it's better to conform, and then you end up conforming to all this other stuff, which is you know just more overpowering. So I think there's that's very that's a deep trauma basically that people carry and and they try to sort of set aside and hide from I think. Um, and the main the main blockage and barrier to us recognizing that this is even happening is the fact that in order for us to block all of this out, we have to block out our real emotions. And it's the emotions that actually will remind us of, of what's really happening. So that's, from my perspective, having gone through this quite a lot, I think that's the main key is to realise that along with all of this overpowering comes also an overpowering of our own feelings. And that's our way back to finding the truth, basically, is to sort of get angry and have all these feelings come up and that relate to all of this stuff, which normally we would block out. So, um, you know, that's... That's pretty, pretty much missing from Western culture, um, mainstream Western mm. culture, and certainly from British culture. It's pretty much the opposite of the British stiff upper lip kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I think you know, it's just be compassionate with yourself and realise that you know we're all injured basically, and um, in a way, we're lucky that we survived all this, and uh, you know, we're in a good position now to actually do something about it um, from a position of experience rather than having mm. having to bow down to other people. So. Um, I mean, when you say that, that what comes up for me is, um, uh, is, is that you know, addiction, um, whatever that is, you know, even if I don't even know if it's real, but whatever, it's a word, and it means different things to different people. But basically, you know, addiction is is the way that I and so many other people around me use various things and various. Uh, various activities and various substances to um, to avoid those feelings um, because they're quite painful when you think about it. Um, and you know, I was thinking like so back talking about addiction. I I think that I think one of the worst addictions. Right, and I, I, I've only thought about that actually today. I, I'm wondering. Well, let me put it this way. Let me ask a question to you and to people watching. What you know? What's a worse addiction? Alcoholism or being addicted to meat? Yeah, it's. I mean, from my perspective, addiction is something you do which helps you block out a feeling or helps you change a feeling to something that you prefer. So yeah. From that perspective, the worst addiction is the one, whichever one it is, that makes it more difficult to break the addiction and for you to get back to your real feeling. So I would say out of those two, on the pure, just addressing it purely from an addiction perspective, 
alcohol is worse because it actually stops your nervous system functioning properly and stops you actually being able to reason and coherently address your addictions. So from that perspective, it's worse because it makes it more difficult for you to end your addiction. But obviously eating meat means that you're actually involved in torture and murder of animals, which in itself is you know, worse than addiction itself in a way. So um exactly. yeah. Uh, I mean, neither of them are good, and I, I think um, we have to kind of break through both of them, basically, so um, I can't really... Um, both of them stop us being happy, and I, I would say probably eating meat is worse overall, because it's actually causing terrible trauma on other creatures who we have no right to do that to, and it also causes us... Lots of people will probably sigh and argue with me when I say this, but... Um, from my perspective, meat lowers our health overall, so, um, yeah, mm. uh, hard to say. I would say, probably, depending on what day you are from or what mood I am, I might say one or the other, but neither of them are good. Yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. I, I, I guess the reason why I asked the question is because, but, you know, if you, if you ask the average person on the street, they wouldn't even know what you're talking about, you know, I think, right? I don't think people see meat eating as an addiction. For me, what, and when I look back on it now, I just like, wow, I can't believe that I was involved in that. Um, and there's so much in my life that is, is so contradictory, you know, and I, you know, so, and, and so in a way, steam it is also a bit, a bit, there's, a, there's contradiction in it for me, you know, um, because I think at the heart, what, I don't know. I don't know. Well, one of the things is that is at the heart, um, a problem at the heart of, of, of our, our society and civilization, if you can even call it that, is, is, you know, is, is this whole money thing. Um, because I, I would, I dream of a time when we just treat each other like we treat our brothers and sisters. I, I don't charge my, brothers and sisters for it, for my services <laughs> but why should I charge anybody for my services well, I mean I tried to live without money as much as I could for a few years and basically I realised that it's fairly simple most people aren't treating us like we're brothers and sisters so even if I try to treat other people like you know, they're my brother and sister that's just going to mean that I end up eventually having nothing because you know, I'm not getting right. anything back so Unless I find people who treat me that way, then I'm I'm going downhill, and that's pretty much why everyone continues doing it, because they know that that's you know even if they really wanted to change, they know that we have to do it kind of collectively, um, up to a point, especially in Britain where everything is dominated by the kind of dominator empire builder kind of mentality, and um, you know it's not like you're in a jungle where you can just run up a tree and pick some fruit or something like that. Like that's those opportunities are gone. So. In a way, it's a very it's a very powerful place to be because if we can solve this problem in Britain, we can solve it pretty much for everywhere else as well. Um, and I think um, I think it's very easy to get caught up in thinking about money as being this kind of evil tool of oppression, um, and to the point where we actually focus on it so much we don't do the things we need to do to solve the problem. Um, and I think, uh, for example, growing your own food is a very powerful thing that we can most of us can do. Uh, or at least we can come together with other people and we can do. And that's really like, you know, printing our own money, or it's even better than that, really, because we're coming back to learning things we need to know and um, tapping into what's naturally ours, the abundance of the universe. And, and that's the key, I think, to actually breaking free of money. And I think that the existence of money is there as a convenience, um, and basically originally as a convenience, and then it became, became an overpowering convenience. Um, and I'll one one phrase I like to describe these things is intimidating form. So it has a form which becomes intimidating. Even though it's just a piece of paper, you know, already when you look at it, it's got like the monarch's crown on it and everything. It's, it's yeah. designed to kind of look intimidating in a way. <laughs> you show it to someone, look, I'm a powerful person, I've got this piece of paper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think... I'm, I'm inside the Bank of England and I was suggesting like, you should be really embarrassed by this, you know. By these pieces of paper, um, and I, and I, you know, I, I said something like, "I'm going to carry a monopoly money as well in my in my wallet, just to remind me." I think I'm going to do that actually. And every time I get out a twenty pound note, I'll just get out a monopoly twenty pounds, 
and offer them which one they want, they're basically the work the same, really. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I sometimes when I go into shops, I do I do say similar things. I'm like, how many promises to pay do you want? And they <laughs> say, oh yeah, they are promises to pay. Aren't how they? many yeah. are you know you want? I'll, I can owe you as much as you want. How much do you love me to owe you? We're never actually going to settle the debt, but hey. Um, yeah, so, but I, I think it's important to understand the history of money, to understand how to get out of it, and, and to realize, even just on a simple level, that it, it really was just a convenience, um, and it represents something which is basically, we call it power, and it's also, really, it's wealth, we call it wealth, but where does wealth come from? It always comes from, basically, the universe, and the universe didn't come with a price tag on it. So really we just need to get back to actually um, tapping into the energy that that created the universe, pretty much, which some people would call God. You can call it whatever you want, but it's where we all come from. And, and basically, when you realize that, you remember who you are, and then you realize this whole money game is just a silly waste of time, really. But um, it's it's a little bit like we're, we're trapped in a kind of maze of our own creation, and, and it's the unconsciousness of it all that keeps it, keeps it in place so we have to become conscious and and then everything becomes clearer and we can take the right steps to in our own lives to solve the problems and and then help other people too so um small baby steps basically isn't it yeah and i mean i guess when you were saying all that which i really um i think you put it really beautifully um you know, my, my concern is my own, um, addictive tendencies and steam it. And, you know, I've, I've started to earn, um, quite well actually on steam it over the past few weeks. Um, and I, I, I see a lot of potential for it. I see a lot of potential for, um, collaboration. I think that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, so, for example, the guy that filmed me um, got a, a large cut because he did all the editing. He got a large cut of the, the reward that I got. He got paid more than he would get paid, I think, on a, on a regular job, I think, or certainly very, very well. Um, so that's like really interesting and exciting. And then there's the other side to it. It says the addiction, you know, cryptocurrencies, it goes up, it goes down, um, spending a lot of time online. There is a lot of really good material on Steam. It really, really good. I've seen some fantastic art the last couple of days and amazing photographs, and it's fantastic. It's just great to be able to give someone a little reward whilst we're in this reward system. And then on the other hand, like you say, you know, I need to also somehow remember that this whole money thing is a is a is a game. Um, I'm not sure I agree with you that it was done for convenience. I'm not sure whose convenience it was for. You know, um, there's a fantastic story in Anastasia, the uh, Ringing Cedars. Have you read them? Okay. Fabulous, fabulous books. Ah, oh, just awesome books, right? Um, really mind blowing. And basically in, uh, in one of them, there's a story about the, the, the priest, the high priest. Um, basically very, very quickly, uh, um, the high priest, um, decides to take all the chains off the slaves. And it replaced them with gold, giving, giving them some coins and, um, saying to them, they're free to go now. All they have to do, if they want the coins is work nice and hard, and then they can get coins. And that, from that day on, they got to work every day at 6.30 in the morning because they wanted the coins. He didn't have to provide them with anywhere to live. He didn't have to worry about them rebelling. It was fantastic. And they thought it was great because they had these coins. It was so convenient. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure where I am with the money thing. I'm not sure that I'm completely convinced that actually money is not that bad. Maybe it is, right? And, and, and the other thing that's kind of connected with that, which is connected with what you said, is I was having a conversation with someone today about, about, um, that, 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 that Uncle Caesar, as we call him in our conversation, you know, Uncle Caesar is a clever little bugger, right? And what Uncle Caesar and the system yeah, do is they basically like the matrix, they suck out our energy. They'll suck out our energy, whatever, which way we, we look, they'll find a way to sucking out our energy. And in a way, you know, that's, that's also the whole, the, the whole thing with money. You know, it's taking away, it's taking my focus 
and I'm focused on some thing for what? You know, uh, even if it's cryptocurrency, it's still it's still taking my energy away to a certain extent from being focused on um, what you were talking about before. You can call it whatever you want. Sure. I mean, I think first of all about convenience, just to clarify what I meant by that. When you said uh, it was done for convenience, basically, of the, of the empire builder rather than for the convenience of the people, that is right. basically what I'm saying. But I'm also saying it's, it's being sold to the people as being convenient for them too. So it is all about convenience. It's just it's just in, imbalanced in terms of who benefits the most. Um, and I think that people, as with a lot of convenient things, like microwave ovens, for example, is something I don't really like, and lots of other things like that, at first, they seem really great in cell phones. You know, they seem really, really good. And then you, when the science comes out years later, oh, actually, they're giving us brain tumors. They, they, you know, they, all these big problems with all these technologies. But they're still convenient. And there's still people that will carry on using them knowing that it's a health risk. And they'll be fully knowing that it's a health risk because it's convenient. And, and well, don't, do you not use mobile phones? No, I smash, smash mine with a hammer. Um, I, I, <laughs> I used to sell them when I was a, a teenager for a while in the shop um, with other things. But I didn't know anything about them at all. Um, and then when I did, basically, we were studying cancer for quite a long time and listening to lots of speakers who study these things. And, uh, and I ended up having to, to do some, you know, reading scientific documents and things which were 10, 20, 30 years old, which almost no one gets to see normally. Uh, and it's quite clear, really, that um, there are significant health risks with microwave uh, emissions from many different forms of technology, including cell phones. And, yeah, I mean, it's a very big topic, quite controversial, but... There's a documentary called um, Mobile Eyes, I think it's called, and there's many other ones. And you can see, like, a picture of um, uh, a tumor on the side of a guy's head that's shaped like his phone, basically. And, and lots of other research, there's actual, you know, sort of published peer reviewed and so on research, which confirms that, um, that the radiation really does manipulate and mess with the cellular activity of our cells and, and cause, it can cause these problems in some people over time. Um, so, yeah, I don't, don't use them. I mean, it, again, I'd love to. It's convenient. But on the flip side to that, I do talk quite a lot about telepathy. And, and coming back to what I was talking about with reconnecting with spirit or the energy that creates worlds or God, um, what I found is that every piece of technology, pretty much, that we have is just a recreation of something which we have naturally inside of us but that we've forgotten about or we've just never even discovered. Uh, so, you know, for example... On a basic level, a car is just replacing our legs, if you want to look at it like that. Um, it's just much more effective. Uh, but when it comes to things like telepathy and mobile phones and video calls and things, we assume, oh, well, we, we have to have a phone to do a video call or to, or we have, you know, to have a voice call because there's no other way to do it. But the more I've actually focused on psychic ability and have some very powerful experiences like that and listen to teachers who teach that, that, that kind of thing, um, I realize, yeah, we, we're basically all telepathic beings. Um, but it's a lost skill, it's a lost art which doesn't get developed because we as children are programmed to, first of all, think that's crazy and doesn't exist, and secondly, to focus on all these other things like looking, you know, maths and textbooks and scoring goals in football and all this stuff. Um, and there's no mention of anything like that. There's no even, no even concept of personal awareness of your own organs of your body and how your mind works and these things. They're not, it doesn't even come into it. So, what chance do we have, basically, of actually finding our actual real ability? Um, and I always remind people, whenever I'm talking anyway, go and check out the video called Animal Communicator on YouTube, which is a full documentary, and you'll see a woman whose job it is to actually telepath with animals. Um, she's hired by zoos and wildlife parks professionally to do this. Um, I, I can't watch it without crying. I mean, I think, basically, if you watch that and don't cry, then you need to really address your emotional issues <laughs> because it's uh, it's one of the most powerful things you're ever likely to see. And, and I think once once we're triggered and realise some of these things are actually real and not just legends or myths and things like that, then that really can make a big difference to how we approach life and how we perceive what's possible. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the problems that seem unsurmountable just fade away because it's like, oh, well, I don't have to be this superhuman or this to do these, you know, these magical things. Someone's already doing it, and they're teaching people how to do it, and it's not actually that difficult. Uh, and it just basically it comes from the heart. Those kind of things come from the heart, and we think again that's something that we're taught is just an organ. It's just a piece of meat pumping blood around. It's has no kind of higher function or 
um, capacity. However, uh, many different scientists now do recognize that, um, first of all, the heart is the largest electromagnetic organ in the body. It creates a very large electromagnetic field. And there's like the HeartMath Institute, uh, I think they're in America or Canada, who have done a lot of research, very good research, I would say, into the heart and these kind of aspects of the heart and the psycho-spiritual emotional aspects and telepathy and connectivity with other beings and breaking down the time-space barrier and things that kind of physics and quantum physicists and theory, theory, people that write theories and thinkers say, oh, well, this might be possible. But well, they're saying, no, it is possible. Look, we've been recreating it for a long time and here's the data, basically. Um, I mean, it's funny you mentioned that because um, one of my favourite teachers who is not, uh, is, <laughs> you, you weren't particularly, uh, you're not on his wavelength, I think you said. Uh, one of my favourite teachers for this, and I think he's quite, I think he'd be quite useful for a lot of people watching it, is Tom Campbell. And he, he's, you know, he's a scientist and a physicist, and then he spent the last 40 years um, kind of exploring um, consciousness. And he says, I mean, firstly, he says, don't believe anything he says. I mean, I've heard him say that quite a few times, um, which I think is, is a good thing for any teacher to say. Um, but he, he speaks about the science of it. And he says that there are, uh, there are so many, um, scientific experiments that prove beyond any reasonable doubt that there is, yeah, yeah there is metaphysical reality. There is healing, um, abilities. There is, uh, you know, remote viewing. People have been, you know, trained to remote view. Um, and that there's so much evidence of, of this done in top universities. I think there's a Pears Institute or something like that. Um, Pears Lab. And he speaks about that and, uh, and accessing that through meditation. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but it's so hard. You know, for me, I can just speak about for me and for God knows how many other people, but it's so hard for me to, you know, to put these phones away and try and do that. Um, I mean, the, the one bit of, like, kind of, uh, I suppose, luck uh, is that I happen to be brought up um, in an Orthodox Jewish home. And every, I, I've mentioned this a couple of times in my videos, every Saturday, or Friday night and Saturday, uh, it's uh, traditional to be quite strict and not to use technology, you know. And uh, so I have kind of an opportunity to get out of that for 25 hours. Um, and, you know, and I, and, and I realize as I even say that, how ridiculous that is, because that means the rest of the time, that's, that's six out of seven days a week, I'm not practicing these, uh, these techniques. I'm not practicing. I mean, I'm going the laden route. Which is what I'm doing now with you. <laughs> well, we're we're making the best of a of a kind of situation where most of us are injured. I mean, is how I would put it. We call it normal, but I would say compared to our highest potential, we're very very injured. We're nearly dead, in fact, to be to be blunt. Um, so from that perspective, we're kind of hanging off the edge of a cliff, and and the phone's ringing, and we're kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it could be an important call, you know, and it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, we need to climb up from the cliff edge first, you know, um, um, and I think the fact that you're even thinking about this means that you're already starting to climb up. That's the important thing, right. to realize, and most people are still kind of just impressed by the, the shininess of the phone, they, you know, that, that's kind of where they're at. So um, I think that... The, the, so shiny, though. <laughs> the Apple, those Apple people, oh, yeah. they're... Crafty, crafty bastards they are. Yeah, they understand the magpie genes. Um, <laughs> I think um, the scientist that you mentioned, when I said he's not on my wavelength, I mean, compared to probably most people, he's very much on my wavelength. But uh, in terms of um, the actual teachers, if you want to call them that, and, and the very many teachers that there are on the planet for these kind of subjects, there are people who I relate to much more. That's really what I'm saying. Which, who are the people you relate to? Uh, well, maybe people is the wrong word, but... Um, so, <laughs> well, I mean, I've listened to a lot of channelings, spirit channelings, and that's a massive subject into itself. But for a while, I was subscribed to the Yahoo mail uh, list, and I was getting 20, 30, 40 channelings a day coming through. Oh my God. World. And, you know, everything you can imagine, basically. And, and a lot of it I felt personally thought was nonsense. But the point is that I, I, list, I read a lot of that. And, and out of all of that, I found a handful of, that I would, that I can relate to. And I say, yeah, this really does sound perfectly. They did. It's all very, very good. Um, 
I, I have issues with all of them at the same time, but um, but that that's the kind of um, angle that I sort of relate to best now because I've listened to so much of it and I've adapted the way that I think and um, and exist basically as a result of that and my experiences. That that's who I most relate to. But in terms of humans, uh, <laughs> sounds kind of funny saying that, but um, uh, there there are people there are like health specialist type people on YouTube, for example, who. There's nobody who I, I relate to 100%, but there are people who I relate to about 80 or 90%. Um, uh, like there's a guy on YouTube called Lou Corona, who I haven't even listened to him for years now, actually, but he's about 67, I think, 65. Uh, and he's probably one of the strongest people you ever see, even though he's literally that age. Um, um, he's done that through, he's an amazing story himself, but um, he's done that through do careful nutrition and certain processes where he cleans out his digestive, digestive tract, um, goes up onto mountains, you know, all the kind of stereotypical, myth, um, mystical almost like things that people do, but that's how he lives. Uh, and I've seen him, for example, if, if you just lift, if you sit on the floor and lift your body up off the ground with your hands, which probably, you know, some people might find quite hard, but I can do that, but he, he can do it so he lifts his feet off the ground like a gymnast, so his feet are up to his chest level, which I can't even do. I can't even do that at all, I don't think. He can hold that for 10 minutes, um, and he's over 60. And I've seen him doing that in the gym, and there were like younger guys, you know, really strong guys, just their jaws were hitting the floor, you know. And, um, he says, I don't hardly work out at all. It's purely just because I keep my body very, very, very clean. Um, and it's all the toxins and crap that we carry in our body that actually prevent us being strong and healthy. Um, and, you know, I... I've, I've used a lot of the techniques he talks about, and I have to say I agree with him. And uh, so it's people like that who live, who walk what they talk, and who actually are a walking example of things, rather than people who sit there and theorise and say, "Well, you know, I think this is what's happening." And you know, that that's fine. But if you actually live it, it multiplies it by a million times. And there aren't that many people that I can name that are doing that, but there's certainly three or four. Um, another guy. Um, he goes by the name Armin Ra, like the Egyptian kind of character Armin Ra. Um, you can find him on Facebook and YouTube. Not sure exactly how old he is. He's older than me. He's probably, I think, around 50, I'm guessing. But he looks about 30. And he's a world weightlifting champion for his class. And he is a doctor of chemistry, I think. And he teaches in schools. And he's basically the fittest person you're ever likely to see. It's just, you kind of look at him, he's like, this guy's, this guy's just different. And he talks like he's from Stargate, um, the TV series. He's kind of like Jafar in that, you know. It's like, yes, it is so very good. He talks <laughs> kind of very, very precisely. And and but the point is that he he because of his background in science, um, you know, maybe past life experience from what I can gather, but he he's figured out a way of basically stopping the body aging um, using. He, he basically only eats one hour a day, so he fasts twenty three hours a day. Um, and he works out, and he has a very specific diet, and he does various things that he's worked out, chemically speaking, and it's working, basically. And so, uh, he has, I don't, again, I don't agree 100% with everything that he says and thinks, but, but he's very inspiring, um, and basically, you know, he's another one I would add to the list. Um, also, the la lady Anna Breitenbach, who, who was in the documentary I mentioned, Animal Communicator, she's the lady who telepathed on the rules, I mean, you watch that video, you'll see she's pretty much the most peaceful person on earth, is all I can really say. I mean, I, I, I've never met anyone that even comes close to being as peaceful as this woman is. It's like, I can't even describe it in words, but she literally is, is a, probably just a factor of a hundred times more peaceful than anyone. You, you know, if, if she'd lived a thousand years ago, probably she would have had a religion named after her or something. But, <laughs> um, but these are the people that I really like because... They're actually doing things that everyone can see and appreciate, and you don't have to read a book even. You can just see, wow, look at that. Um, um, and you don't get to be that way unless you have figured a lot of things out and, and you've, you've worked on yourself and fixed a lot of your own problems, basically. And I think that's where a lot of the scientists fall short, really, is that they've read a lot of books and they've thought a lot and they might have achieved certain things here and there, but they're not focused inwardly enough to have actually come to some of the very important truths that they need. I mean, some, I'm not saying every scientist you know, has failed. Obviously, many of them probably have achieved. I've never even, never going to even meet more than 0.1% of them in my life, I'm sure. But, um, but just the ones that typically get promoted in, in kind of, um, mainstream media and, uh, you know, they become yeah. known typically. They, they feel very short of 
I mean, I think, I think, I think that, that I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, um, it, it's powerful what you're saying. I think that probably um, someone like uh, someone like Tom Campbell, I think he, he, he perhaps is not in. I, I, I can. He's not in the, main, in the same category as the people you're speaking about in many ways. Um, but I think that he has. I mean, he's. De- I mean, he's done lots and lots and lots of meditation. You know. Uh, that to me is already a start. His diet is, I think, is quite clean. Um, and he doesn't eat meat or anything like that. And I think he eats a lot of juices and has a lot of juices. He's probably been not as, as what I might describe as extreme as some of the people that you've, that you've spoken about. Um, but I think he, I think he, I think he has done, you know, some work. I think he's quite helpful. I think he's quite helpful to a lot of people, especially because we, you know, we come from so heady a place. We've been the way we've been trained. Um, anyway, so um, let's let's move on to steam it. Um, so I've you know I've been uh, doing some fu- having some fun with steam promoting steam it. I don't really like promoting publicising it. I've been publicising it. That's what I like to do. And you know I. I People need to take responsibility for themselves, whether they want to get involved in it, they don't want to get involved in it. Um, They have to do the work to understand how it works and then decide whether it's something that they want to be in. Um, In a moment, I want you to tell me what witness is, but I think what what, what I'd like to sort of just focus for a moment um, on on what I like about Steamed, what I find interesting. Um, So I like... I really like the fact that it's kind of, it feels like it's, 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 a, it's its own kind of little virtual reality experiment within this virtual reality experiment. And the way it's run is, you know, to me, um, many, many times better than the way the system is run. Um, so the way I see it is, you know, there, there are certainly aspects of it that have been sort of, that, 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 are, that have been taken from the old system, like the fact that someone with the most money has got the most influence. And, you know, that's an issue. But um, having said that, um, there's lots of features of it that I really like. Um, and uh, I, I like, for example, I, I like the idea that there's, that there's some rogues on there, right? There's some rogues, but, but, but we can see who they are if we want to. Yeah. And people are, people publicize them. So there's a guy on Steam, for example, called Hagen, right? Do you know about this guy? Yeah. So he's got, he's got himself like, he's got into cahoots with uh, a guy who's got lots of steam power. So some guy's got a million dollars or something like that of steam power. I don't know how they got hold of each other. And now he, he puts out 10 short posts every day or five or 10 short posts every day. And each one he's getting rewards of actually about eight or nine hundred dollars because you have to multiply up what it says on the thing. It's more than that. So it's about. You know, he could be making between five and ten thousand dollars a day out of a limited reward pool. Yeah. But what I like about that, and I might be wrong about this, but what I, what I like about it is the way I look at it is that actually Hagen's doing everybody a favor, right? In a way, right? Um, because what he's doing is he's exposing a, a hole in the system, a problem, a loophole in the system. Yeah. And, and, and instead of like, Instead of going around to Hagen's house with a gun and, um, and, you know, and like putting him in cuffs and putting him away somewhere. Yeah. We, we as a community, if we can call ourselves that, um, via the witnesses, I assume have a chance to try and do something about that when we see it. Right. And we can say, okay, we forgive him. Yeah. And who knows what his situation is? Who knows why he's doing this? God knows. Right. We can forgive him, we can expose him, we can do something about it, yeah? As opposed to what the system does, right? Which is basically, the whole system is set up for people to exploit people, for people to cheat, to lie, right? to defraud. The whole thing is, yeah, when somebody when somebody does it, and, so, you know, then they send around the boys with the guns, right? Whilst, actually, you know, the whole system is doing it all the time. Whereas in Steemit, we we can see it because it's it's out in the open. We can see the behaviour. We can see the roads. There's always going to be roads, yeah. And we can choose what to do about it. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, well, I think um, the transparency aspect of Steam is key, and that's one of the powerful aspects to it, because no matter what's happening on there, we can see it. And it is possible to send encrypted messages on there, but that's the extent of the privacy, pretty much. Um, I think there's a lot of different angles on this, and, for example, uh, people need to be aware that, for example, the Steam Incorporated, which is the corporation that actually um, kind of <coughs> contains the code uh, that, that runs the system behind the scenes, so there's that corporate entity occurring. Then you have um, the witnesses who are members of the community who are not part of Steam Inc. And they are people like me or whoever basically has the technical ability to run a web server. And those, which is a big place, which is a computer that's connected to the internet in a, in a key place on the planet. So it's got very high speed internet. And that then runs software, which basically behind the scenes keeps Steam running. So instead of having a big data center, a warehouse full of servers like um, Facebook does and Google, uh, instead of having that, which is very expensive and not very efficient, um, what they do instead is let the community run their own servers, and they pay, you know, I pay for my own server, and, and everyone pays for their own one. In exchange, we get paid a certain amount of money for running that server. And that means that not only does the corporation that started the project not have to worry about that side of things too much, which is good for them, um, but it also means that um, the system is automatically self-healing and it's um, very efficient in a way because people are competing to, to get the top positions as witnesses, to get paid out, and so there's a lot of motivation for people to run those servers very well. Uh, and it, it helps protect the system, it helps keep it all decentralized, and it's, it makes it difficult for, for anybody to shut the network down. So it's kind of inherent to the whole design of Steam and blockchains in general is to have something like that. Um, so that's the kind of overview of, of what we're talking about. In terms of the reward pool, um, that money, basically, as I think of it, it, it comes from, well, it is inflationary. So every day they make new coins, um, and that, that those new coins then are made every day is divided up, and they're divided up, according, uh, divided by all the votes, um, that have, all the posts, all the upvoters that have made votes on Steamit. Every single post will be calculated by the system, and that reward pool will be divided up basically by everybody across the whole system, and that's where they get the money from. Uh, so the point is that that reward pool changes every every so often, every day, pretty much constantly, I imagine, um, according to various different parameters. One of them being the price of Steam and how much money is being brought into Steam from outside of Steam. So the more new users come in, the more the price goes up, the more we can learn, basically. So when you've got somebody basically exploiting what people might call exploiting the system, and, and as you're describing how you're doing, um, it's very easy to view that and say, well, that's a problem, because they're taking large amounts away from the reward pool, which means that everyone else gets less, and it kind of ruins the whole point of, of getting paid out for making posts. And I do agree with that, actually. But the other, the other side of that is that they can't get those, those kind of big posts without the upvoter having got a lot of steam power in the first place, which means that they have to have put in a lot of money into the system. So it's kind of a, a reciprocal situation, even for the people that are kind of abusing the system. They can't do that without having already somewhere along the line someone put a lot of money into the system, which does actually help other people. So there's that to remember. It becomes a little bit like a stage show at that point. Because you know you are getting something from these rogues, even though you might not realise it, because right. they put their money in. You know they paid their their ten bucks to come and annoy you, and they're going to do it. Um, but you get a cut of that ten bucks kind of thing if, if you're going to be entertaining too. So there's that aspect to it. But um, if you go back and read the white paper, which was the original public technical document that was released by Steam Inc. early on, um, and it basically talks about this issue, and it says. The aim really is not to stop what, what people might consider to be abuse completely. The aim is to make sure that it doesn't happen so much that everyone leaves, basically. Uh, and and the mechanism that they give for that is downvoting. So they haven't really done a great job, in my opinion, of making this clear to everyone because the method of downvoting is called report in, in the interface. So it's like, you know, someone's committed a crime or something, you're going to report them. Um, yeah. So that's actually downvoting. And when you downvote someone, you use your power to reduce their payout. So, again, it comes back to the whole thing where the people with the most power in the system have the greatest power to clean it up as well, as well as to upvote people. But what, 
Okay, so so a few couple of things about that, by the way. I know we're going all over the place here, but um, why why do, do, so does does downloading something you don't agree with is that within the kind of ethics of the of the thing? Because I I I would have thought that one of one little thing that I thought would be an improvement would be that if you're actually flagging someone, as they call it, you can call it downloadable flagging. That it should be for certain reasons only, so either abuse, or abuse, uh, abuse, or reward pool raping, whatever you want to call it, or um, you know, or trolling, or I don't know what, uh, oh, oh no, or um, plagiarizing. Yeah. So let's say that for, you should have to choose one or more of those, and then the system can check whether actually that's true. Because I saw someone who'd written a post up. Actually, you'd be interested in this. I don't. You, did you see that? I, I re-steamed the post, and then I wrote the post about somebody. Who'd written about, uh, he's a new, fairly new, and he'd written about, um, the input about using juice fasting to clear up the body and, uh, based on the work of Robert Morse, Dr. Robert Morse. And, um, and some, some medical student had flagged him. He didn't have a lot of steam power, but more than this guy had. And, and he got his article hid, hidden because he disagreed with it. So that, is that, is that within the kind of spirit of the steam yeah. or not? It depends on how you how you look at it. Um, when I first joined Steam, it, the same thing happened to me. I made a post about 9/11, and someone downvoted it, and it got hidden. And I was really angry. I was going like, "No, I've come on here to specifically not get censored, and now I'm getting censored." It was like this is ridiculous. Right. <coughs> but um, that then caused me to ask questions of people, and I did some research into who did the downvoting. I actually found his name and address, but we won't get into that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so the point is that. I had to learn from that, and and it did almost make me want to give up. But at the same time, I thought, well, I can see all these people getting a lot of money on here, and they're not really, you know, some of them are making great posts, but it seems like you don't have to really, you know, be a genius to to succeed here. So I thought, well, I'll keep, I'll keep going. Um, basically, the idea with downvoting or flagging is that you can do it for whatever you want. You know, it, the system is ba based on anarchic principles, meaning there's no ruler, so. That basically means you can do whatever you want. They're, they're not going to tell you, vote for this, you know, vote for that, don't vote for this. You can do whatever you want. But the community is going to, if you, let's say you've got enough steam power to really make a difference when you're downvoting, people are going to start getting annoyed if you start doing things which pisses everyone off. So they're going to actually start to come together to try and do something to stop you. And then, then you end up meeting your own match, basically. Um, and Interesting you said that because I, well, that's exactly what I said. What, what happened with this guy? If that if that stupid medical student would not have flagged him, yeah, he'd have ended up having three people who watched it, yeah. But because the guy flagged him and he told me about it, I then posted his the whole thing on my on my channel. I re-steamed his. He got lots of more viewers. He got you know he got a few dollars. He's going to get the dollars of he basically he's got much more exposure yeah. because of. Yeah. I see. Right. That's interesting. Okay. Kind of like all, all publicity is good publicity, but at the same time, it does become a problem when you've got some of the accounts on there have like the most money on the whole system, and at least one of them loves downvoting. That's pretty much his main reason for being on there. Um, and he's like a well known character. Um, and talking about Bernie Saunders, yeah, without me. and I think he actually has about 10 other accounts, and you probably you know, know him by the names, but um, the point is he's just having fun, and because he's got so much money, he can do that. Uh, and but I have to say, he, I've never seen him, I mean, you know, I don't see everything he does, but I've never seen him flag accounts where I say, oh, you really should have done that, that's a terrible thing, you know, like quite often he is doing things which probably actually should be done. Um, right. And but why, why don't, like, for example, some, something like Cajun, yeah, why doesn't, why doesn't Steamer Inc., you, or, or Ned, or something, you, you know, get someone to use his power to, to do something about that? Would that be against the rule? Would that be against the spirit of it? I don't think it's, it's not against the rules. What's that? No, it's not against the rules, but I think Ned and Steam and Inc. have a policy amongst themselves, like a, a rule they've made for themselves about what they will and won't do, and I think they're holding back in general in terms of they don't make many posts, they don't upvote people, they don't downvote people. Like Ned's delegated millions of dollars to various different accounts and has basically nominated other people to, to act for him, so... Um, it so happens that a lot of them seem to be, uh, I think most of them are South Korean, and you know they're probably not very interested in doing these kind of things, from what I can see. Um, but going back to the white paper, it basically says, 
downvoting is the mechanism to solve these problems. Um, but the, the, the thing that I realized the other day, someone mentioned the word accident, existential threat, or the phrase existential threat, with regards to downvoting. And, you know, if you were trying to make a living, let's say, on Steam, and that was your main income, which it was, was for me for a while, downvoting would be a serious problem. Uh, and so, therefore, you could say that that's something of an existential threat and something that has to be thought about. And what I realise is that if, if if the people with the most steam power are the ones who basically have the most capacity to clean up the system, um, and they are only generally acting when they have an existential threat to themselves, it, as most people tend to do, they don't tend to usually they don't tend to act to try to control someone else unless they feel threatened themselves. Um, some people do, obviously, as you find in the videos, but uh, the point is that. Um, that basically then means that those people with the most steam power have to feel an existential threat of some kind before they can actually do what the system wants them to do, and they don't have that threat because where's it going to come from? It just doesn't have to come from anywhere. So basically it means that the only way for the system to be fully cleaned up, I would say the best way, is perhaps is for the majority of people who have less steam power to work together to actually police it as they want, or I don't like the word policing it, but to, to, to clean it up in the way that they would like it to be cleaned up. And, and it's that kind of mass um, cooperation which society in general is lacking, you know, outside of Steam. You don't really see that very often. There's too many arguments, too many kind of um, belief systems that get in the way of people actually seeing what probably is in their best interest and working together. But that, that I think, is the key thing. That, that would really solve a lot of the problems. But... Um, that comes back to an idea that I put forward quite a long time ago, which was to do with making, I think we talked about this already, and maybe you suggested part of this already as well, which was to basically make the downvoting more obvious to everyone in some way, so that you have a page, uh, like I called it the Rose Gallery, but you could call it whatever you wanted to. Um, so you can always click on this page and see all the posts that have been downvoted, and then if you want to, you can, instead of spending a day looking for the best post to upvote, up you can find the best posts to recover from downvote hell, and, and basically, um, that's another service you can offer the community, and you can post about that and say, hey, I found this post, and, you know, it was really good, it did this and this and this, and then this idiot over here now voted it, and then you're going to get upvoted for doing that. So it's just, it's another service that you can give the community, and I think to make that really work does require a bit of help from Steam Inc., because they decide what happens in the interface of the website, and and that's one of the issues that I have as a witness and as a, as a developer, is that... Um, Although they, they say they like to hear all these suggestions, it's quite rare for them to actually act on them. And what, when I bring this up, quite often what people will say is, oh, well, it's an anarcho-capitalist system. The market decides. So basically, if you think you can make Steemit.com better than Steemit Inc. do, you can take the code from the open source repository and make your own version of it and make it better, which is completely true. And people um, do do that. But it's it's not a small project. You know, It's, it's kind of like... you. You have to have specialist knowledge, and even if you do have all the skills, it's still not a small project. So, mm. um, it can be done. Sorry? Is business that one of those things? Sorry, the call. Sorry? Ah. I've got a call coming through, sorry, I just need to get rid of that. Yeah. I said, I said, is, 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 is busy.org that? Yeah, that's an equivalent of both. Busy.org, Utopian.io, DTube, DSound, DLive, um, and a few other ones. They're, they're sites that um, they operate on the Steam blockchain, so they're all all of these different sites basically use the Steam blockchain as their data source. And then, what approach then? Uh, you could do, yeah. yeah. I mean, or anyone could do, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that's one option. I, I mean, I don't know those people personally, so I don't know whether they're more open right. to these ideas or not. They might be. Um, yeah, that's, that's definitely something to consider. Uh, I mean, I did actually have a go at launching my own version of Steamit.com just on my laptop, just to see what was involved. And uh, um, yeah, it's not that difficult, but it, it's just actually keeping it running and any running any website. The more complicated it becomes, the more time you have to put in on a daily basis or a weekly basis to keep it running. And, um, yeah, it, you'd have to be doing it as a, some sort of business product. You have to be getting something out of it, basically. And, um, I think that's why sites like DTube take a percentage of all the... Um, a lot. All the, a yeah, big percent. <laughs> all the I mean, I don't... Yeah, I mean, that's a different subject entirely, but um, 
So, yeah, it's quite complicated, but I think the, the general ethos, when you say the spirit of the system, I think the core spirit of the system is basically an arc capitalism. Um, and that's something which we don't often see in life. So, uh, and there's people disagree about even what that is. But I think the, the, the point of it really is the sense that I get from, um, Dan, the guy who sort of the engineer it originally, is he wanted to embed that consciousness in there to basically free everything up as much as possible and then let the people that use it solve the problems using what he's given them, basically. And, um, you know, I think there's something to be said for that. And I think you just, the system just needs to be evolved a little bit. And, and I think that bringing it back to witnesses, this is probably one of the most important things to talk about when it comes to witnesses because as well as actually running the hardware that keeps Steam going, witnesses also have a very important role, which is that um, within blockchain technology, there's the idea of what's called a fork or a hard fork, which is where a version of the software gets copied and a new version is created with different rules and different things going on in it. And basically everybody who's participating in running the network behind the scenes has to decide which version of the software they're going to use. And um, this is this very clever system. I mean, Bitcoin has this, and this is why you now have Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Gold and Bitcoin Mr. T, or whatever it is they're going to bring out. Uh, and basically, um, Steam has the same thing. But the issue with this is that to create a fork of Steam, or any, or any cryptocurrency, is a very specialized thing. It's not something even the average programmer is just going to be able to easily do. You've got to really do a lot of work, I think, to make that happen. Um, so we're in a situation where it's a bit like Steam Inc. has the monopoly on um, forks of, of Steam. Um, and when I've made suggestions in the past for changes, I've had a lot of flack from people in the community. I was saying, you know, oh, you're just a new witness. You know, why are you, why are you even daring to mention the word fork? You know, kind of thing. And I'm like, well, read the white paper. You know, this is the whole point of the system. It's meant to be like this. It's, that's that's one of the roles of witnesses is to to make these kinds of changes. And the community is meant to decide basically through voting for the witnesses that let's say a witness says I, I support this new fork then let's say half the witnesses or 40% of the witnesses say we support the new fork 60% say we don't support it um, the community then has to decide well which fork do we personally like and then we're basically going to have to vote for the witnesses that like the one that we like so it's a bit like having representation in parliament uh, except for the voting is real time so you can it's not like every four years or however often you have to make your vote. You can do it any time. So um, it's like basically being able to walk down to Parliament and collectively kick out individual politicians on a daily basis. Um, so that's something that most people, we don't have experience of that usually, so we don't have that in our mind. Oh, that, that's the power I have. I can do that. Um, so there's definitely a big uh, education process that needs to happen with regards to how all this works within the community and to make it really work in, a, in the best possible way. Uh, and that's something I'd like to participate in when I figure out how to clone myself and get 10 versions of myself so that I can do everything that I want to do on a daily basis. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of my, my position on, on that is that it's a very empowering system if you use it in a kind of aware and empowered way, which we have to right. have a way to go to do it really. So. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a, a lovely post by, um, I forgot what her name is. She's a surfer. I met her at Steamfest. Um, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. So she said, like, uh, she said, we're not early adopters. We're the lunatic fringe. <laughs> I like, uh, you know, I, I do think that, you know, that the, 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 there's only 60,000 or 70,000 daily users. If you're if you're just got an account on Steam, it to me that's just meaningless. If you're not using it, then you're not using it, right? And that's a that's a really small amount of people, uh, you know, compared with Facebook, of course. And you know, that, and and so it's uh, it, it is like that. It's the lunatic fringe, but it's uh, you know, I I don't know if anybody's going to watch this and outside of the community because I'm going to put it on YouTube, right? But you know. If anybody's watching from the outside, I, all I can say is I've already kind of mentioned, you know, on the upside of this is that I've met, I've met so many interesting people here. Not just, I haven't met them all in person. I haven't even spoken to some of them like you, but, um, just met some really, really interesting people and I'm meeting more and more. And it's like, um, you know, where would I go really? 
I, I mean, I could probably find the same thing on Facebook if I looked, I suppose. There's probably all sorts of groups, yeah. And at the same time, like, I've never done that. It's never really occurred to me. But to me, this is a great opportunity for me to, to meet, for example, um, artists and look at their work and look at how they do what they do. And, and it's beautiful. It's amazing. And I can even give them some money from the pool. It doesn't even cost me anything. Right. It's, and it's, so to me, that's fantastic. I can see a photographer or I can listen to a piece of music. Um, you know, and I can tip someone for that or I can watch a film, uh, on DTube or YouTube even, uh, and, and tip someone for that. Um, and that, that's pretty, yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the principle of anarchy that underpins all of this is really very close to the natural state of human beings. We're not really meant to have rulers. So, from that perspective, I always like to remind people, it's not the technology that's amazing and that's so powerful, it's us. You know, it's life itself that has that power, and the technology is sort of the way for us to channel that back to ourselves. Uh, and, and because of the anarchic principle that's in there, we're gradually getting to actually see technology which reflects something that's as powerful as life itself, in a way. Um, it, it just reflects, it just frees up the energy that's involved, it's really like that. And, so we can we can make what we want from it. Um, yeah. So I mean, I've used Facebook for a long time. I stopped for a few years and came back to it for various reasons, not really because I wanted to. But um, but the point is, I've used a lot of groups on Facebook, and I have to say, you know, I can only name a couple that I would say have the types of people on in them that that I find quite regularly on Steam that I like talking to. Um, you know, there's not that many, and and most of the groups I've been on. They seem quite controlled. They've got admins who, I mean, they'll kick you out if you say the wrong thing. It's really absolutely nothing like Steam. And I think most of the people who who want to be free and who are awake and aware and think about and ask questions relating to you know freedom and what they really want from life, they are probably by now have it. Most of them have probably heard of Steam. I was saying a lot of them are on there. And, and I think it's a little bit of a parting of the ways, in a sense, to use a kind of biblical phrase. Uh, you know, it's, I mean... Again, that, that, that's a prophecy that's, that's been made by many tribes and groups around the world for thousands of years, pointing to now, around the time of 2012, that humanity's going to split into two different groups, basically, and um, they've got very different destinies, and I think the internet is a way for us to see that in action, pretty much. And, um, I'm not suggesting that Steam users are going to ascend with Jesus, uh, or anything like that, but... Um, <laughs> um, but there definitely is a kind of different frequency of consciousness. Um, everyone has a different, we're all tuned to different kind of radio stations, if you want to think of it like that, our own personal kind of human radio station. And for us to talk, we have to tune into a shared one, or we have to be similar enough for our frequencies to sort of sync up. And people, it's not possible for you to talk to somebody who's wildly different to you, from you, for all different reasons. You won't feel comfortable, you won't understand what's being said. So we automatically tend to sort of come together with people who are somewhat similar to us. And that's what happens on social networks as well. And I think um, people who don't care about some of the things that you and I care about uh, are going to be on Facebook. And they're not even going to wonder, oh, is there something better? Or is there a problem with Facebook? But people who do question that, they're going to be looking around and they're going to find the alternatives and, and see it and other sites are there waiting. And I think the really beautiful thing, one of the great things about this is that this is just the beginning, really, because... Um, Steam it is a template in a way that anyone can reproduce and maybe, you know, in five years' time there's going to be a thousand different sites that offer something similar and, you know, it might be a bit overwhelming, but you'll be able to at least say, oh, I'm this kind of person, I'd like to do this, I'm going to go here and meet these people who talk about this music I like and we're all going to get paid and, you know, we'll do what we do and it's all going to be great. Isn't that the potential of um, smart media tokens, not that I really know what they even are? In a sense, yeah, that's part of it as well, yeah. So, I mean, I, until we see them in action, I won't know all the details either, really, but, um, they are basically that, yeah. They allow, they allow people who run websites to get the benefits, the benefits of the power of the Steam technology and concept, uh, and re kind of name it in their own, re recreate it in their own image, um, and use it on their own website. So when I visit, or let's say I create a Eureka token on my website, People will just see, oh, you know, they'll see it's a similar system to Steam it, and they'll see, they won't see Steam necessarily mentioned maybe once or twice here and there, but basically they'll see it's a Eureka coin and they're going to get paid um, for posting and all that stuff. And yeah, I mean, 
the, the reason why I bring it into, why well, I mentioned it is in terms of being a template for others to, to build on is that even the smart media tokens are, as I understand it, but because they're all based on the Sting blockchain, there's always going to be a degree of what happens on the Sting blockchain affecting every smart media token. So if someone really disagreed with something that was happening on the Sting blockchain, in theory, they would probably want to create their own completely different system. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a stepping stone again. The smart media tokens are another stepping stone. And I think it just depends on how quickly Steam Inc. and Steam in general evolve and stay ahead of the rest of the world in this field as to what really happens. They've certainly got a nice head start. And, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see, really. Yeah. Okay. I think um might be a good place to stop. Okay. Uh, what's that? Okay, yeah, sure, yeah. Or we could carry on, it's up to you. I don't know how, how long have we been talking for? Uh, you know? five minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. It's quite a long time. <laughs> um, we can carry on. It's up to you. Do you want to carry on? Um, I don't mind. I'm, I'm good either way. I'm just trying to think of things to cover, really. Um, I mean, I, I, I could probably ask you some questions. I haven't really, um, because I was dealing with the technical things here, I didn't get too much time to plan it out. But, um, let's see. Uh, so in terms of your vision of... When you when I see all your videos on, on YouTube and you're obviously out, entertaining but also trying to enlighten them and, and change things a little bit as well there's ob- there's an obvious thread that runs through everything that you do which is kind of challenging authority and trying to act in the way that you want to act without being stopped by anyone but you don't generally film yourself when no one's stopping you so you're not kind of filming yourself walking around going oh it's a great day no one's stopping you you're, you're <laughs> kind of deliberately trying to to put yourself in a position where someone is going to stop you and that you know that's entertaining and it's helpful in a way to do that um but i just wondered what would be um what would you do if the world were to evolve rapidly in the space of a week and suddenly no one stops you doing what you wanted to do anymore what would you make videos about (laughs) that would be terrible (laughs) terrible for my view count um you know, it's funny you should say that because um, I was outside the Bank of England. Uh, the thing is, a lot of the stuff that I do is not filmed. Yeah, I just do it for the, I love doing it for hours on end. A lot of it isn't filmed. Um, so I, I was outside the Bank of England yesterday, I think it was, and um, uh, you know, I'm going, I'm saying, but why have you got this big building? You could fit the whole of the British, you know, all the British pounds could fit on my micro SD card. What do you need all that thing for? You know. You know, and eventually these police, these police, two policemen come up to me and I say, I get out my camera and they say, um, I say, well, what have you got a camera for? I said, well, you're filming me. I said, yeah, but you know, and they, 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 I said, for my own protection. They said, it's okay. You don't need any protection from, from me. So I'll be fine. Anyway, so I go, well, listen, I, you know, I, I, I do have to count to 30. You know, that's my thing, right? So I close my eyes and count to 30. And in the background, I can hear the radio and they're going, Oh, it's Danny Shine. Don't worry about it. Just let him do it. <laughs> the Matrix knows who you are. Oh yes. <laughs> so you're, having, so, you're, you're making your way into their system, so eventually. Slowly, it's gonna slowly, yeah. They just thought, you know, what I mean, I mean, it's taken them a long time to realise that, you know, I, I've had that as well. It's like, like the only, only like two percent of the places I go to realise. If they just let me get on with it, I did it in the city as well, somewhere else in the city. And at first, the security guards come up to me and get really angry, and I just ignore them and draw everyone. Everyone then is the crowds get really big, of course, when that happens, yeah. And then eventually, like they, the head of security came along, and he'd known me before, and he just told them to back off, yeah. And after a few minutes, I finished. So they realised that if they just let me get on with it, you know, uh, I'll finish. But the, the truth is, it's. The truth is that um, not everything that I say. I, I mean, I spend some. I spend. I can spend half an hour or an hour in places where I don't get thrown away. You know, I do some. Th- I do things in Camden Bridge, for example. I, I never get stopped there. Never. Right. So I could go on for hours and hours in Camden Bridge. So it's not. It's not just. The, the, I know that the films that I have do involve a lot of that, but. Um, it's not just that that I do. Um, but having said that, 
you know, you, when you, the question kind of reminded me of, um, you know, some of the projects that I have in my mind. I have loads and loads of ideas. And I think that's one of the things, actually, if we talk, carry on talking about Steemit, right? I think, I think that Steemit has already, has already enabled me to, you know, to use camera people and to pay them for it. Yeah. In Steam, which is great, you know, and, um, and it means that I can rely on them. You know, I rely on him. He's going to edit it. He's going to get paid, so he's going to edit it properly, and he's going to do it, you know, in reasonable time. And I think a, a lot of the ideas I have, um, I think I, I need to collaborate with people, and I think Steemit could be a very, very good place to collaborate. I don't understand about Utopian very much, but I, I just got a vague idea that it's that's what it's one of its strength is that it's a really good platform for people to collaborate with each other. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Uh, the, 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 the limitation to it is that at the moment it's designed around a, a website called github.com, which is the world's, I think it's probably the world's biggest repository for open source software. Uh, and pretty much every developer that makes open source code has something on there and uses it. So from the perspective of software, it's a revolutionary thing. It's, it's literally nothing like has ever existed like it before. Um, you can write your own software, put it onto GitHub, make a post on Utopia about that, and you're going to get paid for writing your own software. Uh, and Or you could get paid for finding bugs in other people's software um, or giving translations or whatever. And you get paid quite well. So from that perspective, that's really going to accelerate open source software. I think that's a very, very good thing. Um, it's going to make open source software more able to compete with corporate software, um, and I think that's a very, very needed thing, definitely, for our planet. Um, in terms of just general collaboration outside of software, uh, I would say might not be so effective because it is more tailored towards GitHub and software. Uh, however, there is a new, mostly the new service, uh, which I don't know a huge amount about, called Steam Gigs. Oh, know. yes. Well, yeah. So, I, I, again, I, I mean, I don't know everything about that, but as I understand it, it's intended, intended to be a kind of competitor to services like Fiverr and yeah. things like that, where people can get paid for doing jobs and, you know, basically contract for whatever creative job that they do. And yeah. I don't know exactly how that works with Sting, but I can see it could work very well. And um, So that, it seems like that combined with, um, let's say, maybe a little bit better methods of people communicating built into the system might um, really make it a kind of world leader for cooperation in general. Um, I mean, you don't need to have you know, Steam chat or something like that built in to the survival messaging system because we've all got our own ones anyway. But, um, but certainly, yeah, that, that's something that could be used a lot more than it might be. There probably is at the moment. Um, I think it comes down to having people on there with the skills wanting to participate in that and knowing that they can do it. And, and that's where it all comes back again to discovery and exposure and education. And, and those are the things which, you know, probably need to be focused on the most at the moment, I imagine. There's so, talking about that, I mean, just, you know, the, the, there's just so much to learn. It's, it's, you know, it, it, you know especially with, yeah, with, as, as, as the lunatic fringe, you know, it's, it's so fast. There's so much being developed, and yeah, there's so much to learn, and and that's that's not a bad thing. Um, it's quite exciting and interesting. Um, and if young people are watching this, I mean, you know, I, my children don't don't take what mo most of what I say very seriously, which is fair enough. That's what they're meant to do. <laughs> but, but you know, if if there's any young people watching it, they can be get they can getting early yeah. it can be really the potential for this is fantastic yeah, I think bringing back to one of the points you, you made earlier on about when we were talking about finding space for um, connection away from technology and um, inward awareness and these kind of things which I would say are infinitely more important than seeing it or any technology or anything like that um, but the attractiveness of the system which is you were kind of asking well how do we how do we use this technology and maintain that personal kind of connection inside of us as well and I think first of all you have to make that internal connection a priority uh, above everything else you have to deliberately do that but then when you do do that when you come to use the technology you're not 
addicted to it in the way that it, you can be. You, it's, and it's the same with drugs or alcohol or anything. You can basically just take them or leave them, and, and then you can start to see it as a tool, and you can see seeing it as a tool rather than a, uh, a quick fix to keep your brain stimulated or, you know, um, something like that. Uh, and, and, and it's funny you say that. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but um, it's funny you say that because one of the things I've been thinking, and again, I hope that I'm going to be able to um, collaborate with people, but I, I'd quite like to do um, to do meetups, steam it meetups, and to combine them with stuff that I do on the streets that people can join in if they're available. Let's say take a day. And we're, we're actually talking at the moment with some other steamians about doing a tour. Um, of cities in the, in, in the, around the country. And, you know, what, I, what I envisage doing and I'm kind of developing as I, as I talk and think along, along those lines is, is to have like, you know, a whole day and an evening. And part of the day would be going out and doing fun stuff, funky stuff on the streets with people together. And then part of the day, um, would, would be maybe doing kind of conscious work. Um, whether it's breathing or yoga or just sitting down and talking honestly about our feelings and that kind of thing, kind of spiritual gathering type thing could be dance, could be all sorts of things. Um, and then maybe the, the third part, maybe the evening part, um, would might be a, a chance to talk about steam and steam, all steam sort of stuff. That's my, that's, that, that's a vision that I had. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess with, with that kind of thing, it's something you start small and build up, build up with, isn't it? And uh, if you had a location to do that in, then um, that would be amazing. I do. I, I did post before about a friend of mine who, through synchronicity, um, I've known him since I was 16 years old, and basically he. It's a long story, but he went to Australia, and he, and he spoke to me a few years ago, and he said, oh, "I've got a bar of gold. What do I do with it?" And, and, and he said, "All I can really do is bury it in the garden. You know, it's not going to achieve anything." And, and he's saying, what about cryptocurrency? What about Bitcoin? Should I, should I buy that? And, and we had this whole conversation. And I basically said, you know, yeah, it's better than money, but it's not going to solve all our problems, you know, kind of thing. And then I didn't speak to him for a couple of years. And then after that, he basically sold, I think he sold the bar, the bar and bought Bitcoin, made a load of money. He had a company selling or renting out ATM machines, Bitcoin ATM machines in Melbourne, Australia. Um, to cut a long story short, now he's kind of like a celebrity in Australia for Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, he's been on Sky News, and if people like that want to talk to somebody about these subjects, there's a good chance they're going to call him. Um, but he, he runs a, a company over there called Blockchain Center, which is actually a physical location um, where people can come and network, and they help people start businesses relating to blockchain technology, and basically just meet people, kind of like what you're talking about, but uh, less spiritual, more business-oriented kind of thing. But, um, but they're very relaxed people. They're not like, you know, kind of top hat wearing uh, businessmen or anything. But, um, but yeah, he's trying to open up these centers around the world. He has one in Lithuania, um, a few in China. Um, I think he's opening one in Africa. He wants to have 20 by the end of this year. And uh, there's not one in Britain yet. So um, if anybody out there watching this is interested in participating and creating one in Britain. I think we do. I think what we should do, if you've got a connection with him, Let's make the one in Britain a, a kind of more spiritual kind of place okay. that was like you know was uh, that was like dedicated to to you know the principles that that the that Bitcoin and blockchain technology have has the potential to do you know to free us up to, so that it's not just about money and business but let it be a center of you know health and spiritual exploration as well as you know the financial business connections and crypto. Um, I think, you know, my friend, uh, he spent some time in a Buddhist monastery and, you know, he's not just a, a businessman, basically. He's, he's coming at it from that perspective as well. But I think because it is, it is Bitcoin is itself such a financial technology oriented thing that, uh, and it's all cutting edge stuff, it's kind of difficult to create a, a name for yourself if you're trying to bring too many different things into it at once. So I guess that's why they focus on the business aspect so much. But, um, I will say that with their system or their, their brand, if you want to call it that, um, the barrier to entry is actually the cost of, of the franchise. It's a franchise, basically. So it's not just, you know, putting a sign up in a, in a village hall. It's actually, you know, a full corporate kind of thing. But, um, that's why I was kind of saying this to, I mean, maybe you're interested. I don't know. But, um, but just to viewers in general, 
maybe it's something that people might come together and say, hey, well, as you're suggesting, we want to make it, as Danny says, you know, we can if we get enough money together to start it up. So, but again, you don't have to do anything with him. You can just... No, and you don't have to have a, a centre because I think what can be done is we've got these dates that we're, we're lining up for a tour, right? So what we can do, if we put the dates out on Steam and on YouTube, then maybe someone who someone who lives in near one of those areas will be will, will be prepared to find us somewhere to do it to, to do it. You know, so we only have to find some kind of hall or something, or some kind of venue um, to meet up. And 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 it can be the other thing is it can be financed partially or completely by Steam by the you know Steam votes for uh, upvoting for posts about it. Yeah, I mean, you only need to find a few people who have got a lot of funds in the system who are in, in Britain, and they, you're automatically going to get quite a lot of money arranged for things like that. And so, mm. plus the rest of the community just sees it and thinks that's great and votes it up as well. So, um, I don't know how many how many votes you'd need to, uh, let's say, get a London bus converted to solar panels and covered in stink logos, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but something like that could be an option as well at some point. I have. I am actually trying to get. I'm trying to organise myself buying an electric car, which I was going to um, put on the side. You know, powered by the sun, bought with steam. Right. Yeah. There was there was a guy in Ireland. One of the first posts I saw on Steam when I joined very early on actually did that. He got an electric car in Ireland, and and he I think he had a steam logo on it. And he paid for it with his money from Steam. And, right. Uh, in Ireland, he said he could travel pretty much across the whole of Ireland and never pay for anything because he's got free charge points. Um, yeah, I'm actually thinking about doing something similar, so uh, I'll, I'll race you. <laughs> um, is there anything else you wanted to ask? Uh, no, I mean, I think this is good for now. It's, I think we've covered a lot of topics, and um, you know, you don't want to go on for hours and hours. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it's been a lot yeah. of fun, and um, maybe we'll do it again sometime soon. Yeah.